So I would assume that we here all love Python, or maybe your company offered to pay for the trip and you couldn't say no. Uh, we love Python because of its expression power and nice learning curve and its uh, coding style. Um, the fact that many language, language features look like native languages, the general straightforwardness of Python and general lack of, uh, lack of uh, hidden tricks makes it appealing both as the first language for people who just started uh, programming and as a new language for experienced developers. Practice shows that um, uh, you can quickly start doing useful things in Python if you're already experienced programmer. So I used to program for Microsoft.net and C-sharp for five years before I got into my first Python project. I, uh, I didn't really know that much about Python. I didn't have any formal training in Python or read any book in Python. So my approach was purely practical. I was only interested in getting my task done and not really getting too deep into theories. That was three years ago. Since that, I learned a lot about Python. But what I noticed is that many tutorials, books, blog posts that feature uh, advanced concept, they usually use really impractical examples. Like for example, how to generate Fibonacci numbers. Who really generates Fibonacci numbers in production? So that's why I decided to make this talk and uh, provide some practical examples on usage of advanced language constructs in Python. So I'm not really here today to teach you, but more to provide interesting ideas, examples, to inspire you uh, to practically use those constructs. So quick check. Uh, please raise your hands, those who use yield keyword in production code last in, within last year. Wow. I'm surprised. A lot of people. Good. Uh, who wrote a, himself a decorator uh, in last year in production? OK, great. Who wrote context manager uh, within last year? OK. Uh, so it's good, so you, I, you're more familiar uh, with the theory, so I can not really focus too much on it and jump to examples. So for my examples in this uh, talk, I used a uh, code from my project that I worked on, and I collected a code from different open source libraries. So uh, what is iterable in Python? Uh, all the definitions I took from uh, official glossary. So, well, it uses uh, pretty vague abstract definitions. Uh, uh, so what it practically is a terrible. A terrible is an um, object that has an iter a method. Uh, where can it be used in Python? It can be used in a uh, for statement in the loop. It can be used in list comprehensions or in generator expressions. Or you can pass it to functions uh, that expect iterable, like all, any, some, filter, um, uh, whatever. And I would like to uh, draw your attention to iter tools. For those who don't know, it provides a lot of very useful functionality to work with iterables and iterators. So uh, I said that iterable returns iterator. So what's the iterator? Iterator, basically the uh, whole uh, functionality of iterator is to keep the current state of iteration, like for example, if we are iterating over a list, is to remember the current element and that's being returned. And basically only thing it has to do, it has to provide a next method, uh, which basically pr it produces a new value on every iteration or raises a stop iteration exception if the iterator exhausts it. Well, uh, how it can be created? You can uh, create a class, implement method next and instantiate it. Uh, I would like to point out this completely impractical uh, way, and I won't be really talking about it. And then generator expression. Uh, generator expression looks very much like list comprehensions, except that it uses uh, around brackets. It's an important difference. Basically, in list comprehensions, you immediately uh, force the creation of the whole list and uh, production of the whole values. So it, it takes memory, and it's not very actually u useful and well. So. Uh, my strong opinion is that for most of the time you should prefer generator expressions over list comprehensions because uh, it saves memory and sometimes you don't even need the whole list uh, of, the, uh, of the values. Then generator functions. So generators, generators is a function that has a yield keyword in it. Well, uh, many of you raise hands, so I won't go too deep. So this is the most practical way to create a complex it iterators in Python. Uh, it was introduced in the same version of Python as uh, iterators uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, author of Python uh, immediately understood that creating classes for iteration is not very convenient. Uh, it, you can read the discussion about it in Feb uh, 255. Uh, it grew into something way larger, into coroutines. But uh, this is outside of the scope. So. 
quick, uh, quick glance how it works. So if um, function has a yield keyword in it, it's marked as a generator. When you call it, it doesn't actually execute a function, it just creates iterator object. When you iterate over it, the control flow will actually step into function and go to the first yield, then return it to the a loop outside, and then stop until next iteration. So let's quickly uh, run through it. So this is how it will be executed. It will go, it will print, yield, it will return, but on next iteration, it will start from the next line and go until next yield or end of function. So this will print uh, the one to, uh, zero two. So what's the difference between the uh, regular function is that it remembers its states between the calls. So what can it be practically used for? Because many people, uh, when they study the subjects, they don't really know, well, okay, this seems cool, but what can I do? One of the very uh, common usage of uh, generators is basically to create a view over a collection, do some filtering and mapping. So this is the code from a project I worked on. We had some list of fields. Some of them uh, were considered dynamic, started with some prefix, and um, Basically, we needed to get a list of the field na dynamic field names in different places. So we wrote this uh, simple generator. What's good about it? First, uh, you don't need to copy paste this for and if everywhere you need the list. Second, it, it looks clean. It's uh, easy to read. Well, it's uh, multi-line list comprehensions or generator expressions are, well, ugly. So this is the, well, this we want some filtering and then we want some mapping. So another co very common way to uh, write uh, generators is to flatten lists. So this code comes from Django framework. So uh, flattening lists, if you have a list of lists and you want to iterate over all sub-elements as if it was a well, uh, single stream of values. So they, it's basically usually done with a nested uh, force and uh, so they created this iterator so they don't need to copy paste this to force everywhere. It's actually a good and bad example because iter tools module provides a much easier way to uh, flatten lists uh, with the uh, iterables. Uh, that's um, that's the, how, how it can be done in one line. So it's a very popular question on Stack Overflow so I would assume that well, yeah, people have difficulties with it. But uh, there can be more complicated flattening uh, list logic. This code comes from Django, uh, from Jinja. It's a templating engine used, uh, often used with Flask framework. So they have a list of items, and item can be a node or a list. So if it's a node, we uh, return it, we yield it. If it's a list, we go into subloop. So this is, uh, here you can't use a really iter tools, uh, so this is an example of more complex flattening. So what it can be also good for generators is to save memory. So this uh, code comes from request library, is a so-called HTTP library for humans, uh, whatever it means, uh, but it's very convenient for library to do HTTP requests. So somewhere in the depth of it, they have a socket object, or I know some sort of wrapper, self.row, that can, that, well, it's a network stream, it's a sequence of bytes, but uh, uh, responses from servers can be fairly large. We don't really want to load them in memory completely. So they wrote an uh, iterator that breaks it into chunks, and you can iterate over those chunks without actually loading the whole content of the response into memory. That's very convenient because it saves memory, and it's convenient basically because of, uh, users of this function may not really need a whole, uh, a whole response in uh, memory it can be used to directly write those chunks into file, uh, so you can save it locally, but, and it's uh, good for memory and performance. So it's a, more, a little bit more complicated. So this is their internal usage of this uh, chunks um, iterator. So what's they doing here? So it's iterator that takes uh, uh, iterator of chunks and produces iterator of strings. So chunks have a fixed length, but uh, strings it can be arbitrary length and they're divided by delimiter. So what they do here, they break a chunk into strings, but it can happen that the remainder of chunk is in complete line and we need to, another, to get another chunk to complete it. So here we, they introduce a state, a local variable pending, which, which carries over a leftover of chunk that is uncompleted string. Uh, they keep it before, between yields and uh, they add it to chunk so that uh, they can, they remember it between calls so that um, 
they can uh, connect it with the rest of the string and return it. So if if the chunk there are no more chunks, then they assume that pending is a complete string and return it. It's a, a convenient example how also you can save memory and create a, a iterator over iterator with the generators. So uh, iterators uh, generators are also convenient to traverse complex data structures. So this is example uh, of source code of standard OS module as a function walk. I simplified it significantly. Well, it's like 200 lines of code, but this is the core of it. So it uses um, recursive, iterate, recursive generators. So it's um, very convenient in this case because the uh, file system is tree data structure. So walk returns a uh, tuple of uh, current path, the list of dears in this path and the list of files. Then it goes over the list of directories in current path and calls itself basically and yields the results. So in the end, if we iterate over walk uh, generator, we will get a flat list of uh, hierarchical data. That's very convenient. Uh, also, iterators can be infinite. So some people may wondering what why would you need an infinite iterator? You can't even iterate over it. You can't do four over it because it will like eat all your memory and burn CPU. Uh, this is example, this is Django templating language for those who are unfamiliar. It just uh, basically copies the four, four tag copies its contents. It here generates a rows in a table. So we would like to uh, often, in, you know, in web, uh, the, we have tables there, the rows come in different colors, one after another. So uh, Django has this cycle tag, which actually will produce on every call row one, row two, row one, row two. Internally, it's implemented with a iter tools cycle iterator, which is infinite iterator in the uh, lower part. The mouse pointer. In the lower part, you can see, uh, well, it basically takes a terrible and then repeats it uh, one by, uh, items one by one forever. So every time this uh, tag is called, it calls a render method and it just calls a next item on the iterator. So it's not a problem that uh, iterator here is infinite. It will not never try to iterate over it completely. It will call it exactly as many times as uh, four iterates. So this is very nice and clean code. You don't need to maintain any state like which value was returned previously. You just call next and cycle. So again, I advertise you uh, iter tools uh, module. So uh, those are uh, the most common practical examples uh, for using, but I uh, recommend you to research deeper because iterators, generators is very complex topic in Python. It has way more advanced usages. So I recommend you to uh, look more into iter tools, um, iter tools uh, module and master it because it can improve your productivity. Uh, then actually yield is not the statement, it is expression. So it can be used as a mechanism to pass a values from caller to uh, generator. This can this later uh, led uh, Python to even more advanced stuff. So. Now, then I recommend you to uh, read about yield from, it's uh, so-called generation delegations. And they are, those two uh, features are used to implement coroutines in Python, which is also very interesting. And based on coroutines, there is a new, well, relatively new uh, module, well, the whole concept in Python called async or X project tulip. It's for asynchronous input-output, and they're heavily based on coroutines, generators, and iterators. You actually don't need to uh, photo the slides. Uh, I will put them online, and um, so yeah, you can, don't worry. If you miss something, you can check it out later. So another advanced feature that's all, often not used in practice uh, by, uh, well, maybe starter developers, it's uh, decorators. So again, many of you raise hands, so uh, I would assume that Many of you know how decorator works. Basically, decorator wraps uh, your function with uh, some inner function. What it, uh, basically all it does, it assigns to your function the, the decorated, the wrapped version of your function. What is it good for practically? With a decorator, you can modify input arguments. You can uh, modify return value. Uh, well, you can do things before call, functions called, after functions called. You can actually not call the function at all. So your decorator may decide not to call function for some reason. Uh, you can modify some global states, some 
outer variables, some uh, thread locals and stuff like this for this function and then set them back to the values that were before that. And it can, uh, use, uh, decorates can be useful to assign metadata to functions of all sorts. So this is example from uh, Flask uh, web framework. They heavily use decorators. So we, they demonstrate uh, two things. Here it, it is, hello is a web view. It's basically a function that is called when, when you call uh, your, your web server uh, slash hello or slash hello name. So what they do here, they uh, use decorators to parse URL into function arguments. And another usage of uh, decorator here is that it uh, basically makes it possible to discover the functions. So the, so the framework knows which functions are web views. So in this sense, it provides a metadata for uh, your application. Uh, this is the small snippet from, from my uh, current project. So we have this, we want to make extensible list of, uh, extendable list of, well, some filters, whatever that means. And we would like to associate, uh, we would like to show them on UI so users can select from a list. So we need a, some like sort of label for those fields. So I created this decorator that provides a human readable description that is used on UI. Also, I can query all the functions in the modules and check if, if they have this, um, uh, if they have this decorator. So it's also good for discovery and for providing metadata that can be used in, for example, in UI later. So, uh, call or not. So, with a decorator, you can make a decorator that decides we, maybe actually we shouldn't call the underlying function at all. This is, again, simplified example from Django. They have a decorator called permission required. So, you can apply this decorator on a web view function and check if the currently logged user has certain permission to call this web view. So what we can see here, they check if the current user has this permission. If user has this permission, they call, they call the actual function. If user doesn't have permission, they don't even call the function. So that's, that, that's how you can uh, check whether you should actually call function or not or raise error or whatever, do something else. Uh, this is a decorator rate limit. We created in one of my projects. Basically, it's also for web views. It counts in a cache how often the page is called by um, a certain IP address. And for example, if it's called more than 10 times in a minute, we will not generate the response, we'll show an error. It's a very simple mechanism from prevent of uh, ab abusing of a uh, service. Uh, yeah, so if the user calls it too often, we can uh, prevent call completely. Uh, caching is a very big feature that can be done with decorators. So this is, in our project, we created really simple, and I have to confess a little bit stupid, caching decorator that we apply on properties uh, exclusively. That's an important point. So we have this uh, num persons and it, it counts, it, it's the Django uh, ORM, so basically just counts uh, related objects. So uh, this function is called, this property is co called a lot in reports, so we have a report that calls this function, I don't know, like 20 times, right? And uh, we can just drop this decorator cache result here, and it can very conveniently uh, prevent too many of the calls. So, uh, how we implemented it. It's also very straightforward. So you can see uh, here we get the func name that will be numpersons in this case. So if uh, the, uh, the object has this attribute, we, re we do get attribute. If it's, not, uh, if it's not in the object, we actually call the property, calculate it, and then set uh, corresponding attribute, and the subsequent calls to this property will return the, the cached value. So what's bad about it is basically that, uh, yeah, if, say, if underlying object or data changes, well, <laughs> you, there is no way to enforce recalculation. But this is good for simple cases. Uh, like, uh, for example, yeah, if, you, if you're sure that your object 
won't change. So the proper way to cache with the decorators, there is this awesome, I really like this, uh, library called Dogpile. It actually creates proper and very sophisticated way to cache um, to cache uh, functions and uh, method, everything. So the, the key decorated there is caching arguments. You can provide different backends, memcache, local memory, anything, and they will um, actually cache f uh, the functions for corresponding arguments as well. So it, 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 the cache key will include the function arguments. It's very smart, you can refresh, you, ca you can refresh values and everything. I recommend, I suggest everyone to look into this because that's probably the most sophisticated caching um, library with the decorators I've seen so far. Uh, my, <laughs> my personal award for most creative use of decorators goes to uh, Ansible. Ansible is a very powerful tool for IT automation. Uh, you can use it for deploying your code and servers, and manage your infrastructure. Uh, I also recommend you to look into it. Uh, it's very powerful. But inside of it, they have a very interesting uh, decorator called timeout. Uh, so you can just apply it to function. What it does, if the function takes longer than, well, by default, 10 seconds to execute, they stop the function execution and uh, raise an error. How they implemented it? So they implemented it using uh, Unix signals. So before the function is called, they said, said uh, sig alarm it, uh, with a, a callback. So uh, and then they set the alarm to seconds. So what happens? How does it work? Uh, it's a, a kernel feature of, of uh, Linux. Well, any other POSIX compatible OS. Uh, it will it will set this alarm internally, and when this alarm goes off. Uh, it will call it will call the handler method. So and handler method will raise uh, timeout error, and this timeout error will appear within a function, and it will exit the function immediately. So if it takes longer, it, will, it just stops the function and exits. So this is a pretty nice way to do a function by timeout without do using threads. Well, obviously this uh, will not work on Windows. Sorry, but this is mostly for Unix operating systems. Uh, digging deeper, uh, so uh, decorators are can be way more complex than examples that I showed. I s there was a previous talk um, today. Unfortunately, I, did, I missed it, but uh, I, I they cover they covered. I hope maybe someone of you were there. They, uh, in the program, they wrote that they will cover advanced uh, cases of uh, decorators. So in, decor decor in decorators, you can decorate classes, and decorator itself can be a class that maintains a state. So you can create way more complex things. But I would say in for more pr most practical cases, the de simple decorators are enough. But I recommend you to research more into this. So context managers. Context manager, uh, this is how well, how, how you call with the with statement. It's just a very simple thing. It's basically, it calls enter on a, on a context manager object and returns a, a value and signs to variable. Then it calls the actual code that is within the with the statement. And finally, it calls exit. So what it, ca what it uh, can be good for? It's uh, good for if you want deterministic release of unmanaged resources, for example, files, everyone must use with with files in Python uh, because it will close the file immediately after you stopped using it. It's also good to modify some global states. For example, you can select a piece of code that will be executed within transactions or you can set some setting just for this uh, piece of code and then restore the settings. And it can be used uh, a lot of interesting tricks for logging, for more advanced logging and debugging. So. A uh, couple of examples, Django. So they have session transaction. So on exit, on exit, basically they check if the current scope was within a transaction. If yes, then we need to uh, commit the transaction or, well, on error rollback. So that's, that will uh, put the, it in a transaction. Uh, the w important here is that finally it's called uh, always. 
So whatever there is error in transactions or not, it will uh, call this, the exit method always. So for example, in requests uh, library, they have a session a context manager. When you exit it, it closes the session. It's also good because you should close it as fast as you stop using it and not when garbage collector picks it and calls it. Uh, this is a small um, uh, context manager that I wrote for debugging. Basically, when it enters, it stores internally the time when you entered into a function, oh, not function, of the piece of code, and when you exit, it just prints the amount of milliseconds it took, uh, it took to execute uh, your piece of code. This is very simple and very easy to do micro-profiling uh, sm small chunks of codes without you know, doing too much um, calling profiler and all this stuff. So digging deeper, again, I of course didn't uh, cover all the usages of uh, context managers. So Django does a lot of stuff with the context managers, especially when it comes to transactions. Uh, they also have a, it's both decorator and context manager because it wraps some piece of code. So also you can implement with the decorators and context managers, you can implement uh, database locality. So you can select, uh, for example, let's say that this function or this piece of code, depending if it's decorator or context manager, all the queries will be executed against slave database. It's, for example, useful for reporting. You have a function generating a report. You can create a context manager saying, okay, use slave database for all queries in this. Also, more sophisticated log and debug, not just uh, uh, <laughs> stupid milliseconds, which is actually very, has very low precision. And yeah, you can do some more sophisticated profiling. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, this is my email. You can uh, send me suggestions, questions, whatever. I registered that stupid domain of, uh, for my personal blog. Uh, I will, I'm going to put uh, the slides and there. And I, I started a series of uh, posts, which basically I cover the same stuff, but in more details with better explanation. So if you miss something, uh, you can come there and uh, yeah, all the, all the content from the slides will be there within the blog. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, do we have time for questions? Okay. Um, one question, did you already see this LRU cache module in the standard library? That's mm -hmm. kind of doing the same thing as one of your examples. Mm -hmm. It just caches uh, the result code, uh, the result value for specific parameter sets. Mm -hmm. So may maybe you can also use that. Uh, one question: Did you already discover a good pattern to op uh, to handle open files? If uh, you are sorry, uh, discovered what? To to handle open files if um, the context is not a as local as in sometimes with with. So you basically need to give around an uh, open file handle and still you need to make sure that it is closed at some time. Is there a good pattern for that? Uh -huh. Well, uh, uh, yeah, well, with the context, well, answering the first question, yes, there is, uh, there is a lot of this uh, caching. There are a lot of caching done with the decorates in very different libraries. But I recommend uh, to check out Docpile because it's, as I told, it's the most advanced one. It has the, the richest functionality. Uh, coming to the next one, well, if you want to use file in different place, well, then it's uh, a little bit, uh, get, gets a little bit more complicated than, yeah, you, will, you, 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 you can't use a, well, context managers are good for small chunks of code. So if you have a few lines, but uh, yeah, you can write your own class that will uh, store a file handler and once this, uh, and you can cl call close on your own class when you finish doing with this. I wouldn't, uh, as far as I know, there is no like straightforward thing uh, to do it uh, with the context managers. Hi, <coughs> hi. Is the order of the decorators important? Is if I have like, for instance, three decorators, <coughs> sorry, is it going to grab the following decorator? Yeah, this is, is this is, <laughs> you're right. This is a tricky part. Um, Yes, yeah, so decorators, the order of decorators affect, affects it. Uh, so some decorators, for some decorators, it's important, the order is important in, in which you do it, but uh, for some it's not. So uh, yeah, order matters. Uh, 
in general case, in more specific. So you can write the decorators that, for example, I will can give you a very, very small example, uh, specific, where was my uh, wonderful cache. So here, it's important a property should come before a cache result. Otherwise, if you do it the other way, it, it won't work. Just, it just won't work proper, properly. But because the property is a special, uh, it's a building decorator. Yeah, but um, you can, for simple decorator, you can write the logic the, in the way that it, it wouldn't matter. So it really depends on, yeah, particular decorators. But evaluate bottom up, right? Uh, I think it actually, no. It actually, first it will call cache result decorator, and the, only then it will call property. So that's why it's important that property will be like outermost. Yeah, yeah. This is a tricky, this is a tricky part, yeah. Any other questions? Comments? We still have a few minutes. Hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, just one observation about the wrap decorator that the standard library offers. So I saw that in one example that's present and in the others when you are writing a wrapper function, you are not using that. So I think it's worth mentioning that it is better to use because it uh, copies the doc string and function's name and those things. Yeah, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right. Um, practically, you should use, yeah, wraps mm -hmm. from uh, functutils uh, module. That's absolutely right, because it will keep the function name and doc uh, string and all, all the stuff, yeah. But it was just like too much uh, for the talk, but you're right, thanks for a note. Okay, can we push for one more? Questions, comments? Or if not, let's thank the speakers again. And